Intel today announced its DG1 graphics card for software developers, which is a laptop XE GPU, except it's strapped to a PCIe add-in card for developers. Although Intel didn't officially allow benchmarking of its new DG1 graphics implementation at CES, we were able to do some frame rate analysis by recording the screen during gameplay with a high FPS camera and then later counting the frames in our hotel suite. Our news today will talk about the DG1 PCIe card, XE laptops, and briefly about a foldable screen. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. First up, Gordon from PC World and I had a bet on the frame rate for the hands-on demo of Intel's XE graphics solution and its Tiger Lake laptop. And I said that Destiny 2 felt like it was playing at about 37 FPS. Gordon went with 35, but then he changed his mind and went to 42 FPS. And then Adam, their camera operator, went with 33. So Intel said we'd never be able to figure out who won the bet since the product will change so much before its final launch, which is likely. And the prototype that we saw would probably not have its frame rates revealed to us. That said, we ended up using some software to count the frames and figure it out anyway, because with a Computex dinner on the line, it was worth doing the extra effort to find the frame rate. We'll start with the DG1 GPU and then move to the brief benchmarks and hands-on experience. Intel sent photos over of its DG1 PCIe card for software development, which will be used by developers ramping up to support the new Intel hardware. This is a necessary step since Intel is starting from ground level and has no driver development at present for GPUs. It's not like AMD and Nvidia where millions of dollars of driver development and uh, upwards of decades of work have built a foundation for the cards. So Intel has to get these out to software developers early to make sure that the software actually works with the card. Intel's DG1 PCIe card is what the company is calling a software development vehicle. And these are common. They typically go out to ISVs or independent software developers and software vendors. And they use these devices to get the early groundwork in for software that needs to run on the GPU. NVIDIA and AMD do similar things. So we have renders of the card, but that's about it. No physical card was present at the meeting we went to. There was a separate Intel meeting we couldn't make at CES. And at that one, they had a Warframe demo running on DG1. There was no, no reveal of the specifications of the card and also the settings for the game, the graphics settings were not revealed either. So not a whole lot of useful information from that for determining performance. These types of demos are always strange for that reason. It's sort of to flag that the product exists and that's about it. And sometimes there's a business play here where the company isn't even going for really any kind of consumer attention. They're going for other companies attention. And that's the case of the foldable screen that Intel had as well, where it's more of a signal to say, hey, partners in the ecosystem or in the industry, we have something that we can work with you on. Uh, they could also do that privately, of course, but this makes a bit more noise about it. So it's kind of a weird demo because the uh, there's not there's not much actual information that we can do anything with. We do have some information for other benchmark settings, though. In our meeting at the Intel booth, Gordon and I approached the Intel Tiger Lake laptop team that was representing the XE graphics deployment. And Gordon specifically asked something along the lines of, cool demo, what can we do with it? And the answer was, it's an experience, at which point most media will sort of sigh in disappointment because it's normally code for being a hands-off demo. In this instance, it was sort of hands-on in that you could pick up a controller and play the game, but there's no information at all about what's happening on the laptop itself. So it's fairly limited in information. We were given the option to play Destiny 2 at 1080p low settings with what we think was 100% resolution scale and what I'm pretty sure was a controller, but we use keyboards, so not really sure on that. As for experiences, it was honestly pretty poor. Destiny 2 is not that intensive of a game, but it is a competitive shooter and uh, or even just any kind of FPS would, would have this uh, be an issue too. And the latency ended up being noticeable. So input latency, the click to response latency was noticeably poor. So 
it's a good thing auto aim was on, but we didn't have the, the foresight to do a sneaky latency test like we did with a sneaky frame rate test, but it was still bad. There was a clear delay from input to response. Simple movements could be felt with, for example, a, a, a right thumbstick movement to look. You'd push right, do nothing else with the controller, push right, and feel a response significantly later. It was certainly not close to instant. It felt like more than 100 milliseconds and uh, probably approaching 200, but not sure, sure by eye. Definitely felt like more than 100 milliseconds, though. It certainly wasn't between the 25 and 80 millisecond window that we're used to with typical PC platforms. There is a, a bit of a relationship between frame rate and input latency as well. So those two things uh, will impact each other. As far as the FPS and the latency, to give Intel credit, Intel did emphasize that this is not a final product and that an updated version should improve performance. That's probably true. To what degree, we're not certain, obviously, but there have been, even by NVIDIA and AMD, uh, game driver updates in recent history that provided double-digit performance increases. Sometimes you see as much as 23% uh, percent in recent memory for a specific game with a specific card. So it's possible to get big gains. Typically, it's not quite that large, but either way, we're giving Intel a bit of the benefit of the doubt here because it's not a product yet that they're even willing to show us the specs of. So it's hard to criticize in that regard. But as far as experiences, and this was the whole point of the demo, it was not a good one. For frame rate, we were able to frame count the specific non-combat part of the demo that we captured with two different sets of numbers. Note that you won't be able to frame count our footage in the YouTube upload because it's rendered down to a lower FPS than the native capture. If counting environment updates where player animation was not updated, the numbers were higher. If only counting full frame updates that included player animation changes, the number was lower. For our frame rate updates, wherein we allowed environment updates without changes to player animation to count toward FPS, the numbers were 44 FPS for sample one, 46 FPS for sample two, and 49 FPS for sample three, averaging 46.3 for the section of the game we were in. If you only count player animation updates and disregard shadow and lighting updates, the numbers were in the 30s, but we're not at home and unsure of if Destiny 2 updates the player animation with each new frame. So we're going to give Intel the benefit of the doubt here and call this a 46 FPS average from a very rapid show floor benchmark with some more variables than we'd like in it. When Destiny 2 first launched, we did a whole bunch of in-depth testing on it. And this was a while ago now. It was back when the game came out, so things have changed. But one of the things that we learned and is probably still a constant was that being in certain areas in the game, particularly those that were combat heavy, were, as you'd expect, likely to bring frame rate down than in areas like we were in for the Intel demo, where we had already eliminated the enemies in the benchmark, or in the game rather, and so we're left running around an empty map. So they might be a bit lower in combat areas, but anyway, this is all kind of hacked together on a show floor, so we'll have to revisit this once the product actually comes out. At 1080p low, sub 60 numbers, which is definitely what this was, and definitely sub 50, uh, probably in the 40s like we're, we're showing here. But sub 60 FPS numbers are not impressive at 1080p low with Destiny 2. Being a shooter made things worse because it's genuinely, it's, it's technically playable, but if you're competitive, it's unplayable. And if you're not competitive, it's unenjoyable. So experience was not good, even with the mouse and keyboard we, we suspect. Uh, you'd still have issues aiming at things and moving in a way that is predictable. So uh, we'd like to see more from Intel on this front. In the very least, maybe hold off on the demos. Don't try to make noise about a product that is going to perform poorly in the eyes of people who are experienced gamers. So this is a mobile GPU. The mark is lower to hit than a desktop GPU. It's supposed to be more than a normal HD series IGP. and. Uh, even still, we, just, we weren't impressed with it. As for the other stuff at Intel Suite, the company had a foldable 17.7 inch display. That was pretty interesting. It has a socketable sort of keyboard on it. There's, I don't know, there's a sensor. They wouldn't specify what the sensor was when we asked, is that a photo sensor or, or what? They just said there's a lot of ways you could do it, which yes, but there's basically a sensor of some undisclosed variety that when you put the keyboard on the folded part of the screen, uh, I guess it would somewhat intelligently resize the screen so you don't have to deal with touch issues. But anyway, foldable thing looked cool, just not really the main reason we were there. We were there for DG1 and 
for the NUC. On the NUC side of things, we did see the Ghost Canyon Intel chassis. It's got very good ventilation on both sides, so full credit to Intel for that. Intel apparently did the design in-house. They didn't contract it out to a case manufacturer. Obviously, they hire a factory to make the case, but uh, Intel says that it made the design on its own. It's fully ventilated, and it's a small 5-liter box or so. It can fit about an 8-inch GPU. It's going to be some spacing issues between the NUC module and DGPUs, where thermals will probably be a, a bit of a point of concern for the, the recessed NUC module. I'm not 100% sure why they didn't face them opposite directions, maybe for, for I.O. reasons or something. But uh, the, the chassis looked good, and that's probably the upside of Intel Suite. DG1 on PCIe will exist in the immediate future for people who are developing software for the uh, Tiger Lake stuff and for DG1 in mobile. And then we'll hear more about the, the proper discrete GPUs later, although Intel did technically call this a DGPU. It, we need to obviously... Everyone's waiting for the gaming parts. So check back for that whenever that happens. Otherwise, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net. And if you want to check out the NUC coverage, we have a full teardown of the Ghost Canyon box. It's genuinely pretty cool. And another cool implementation of it would be to socket it into an existing system and use it as a, as a discrete streaming box. So there's a lot we can do with that. But patreon.com slash gamersnexus, store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.